Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back for this women-only panel. <laughs> uh, actually, we have two gentlemen online. Um, well, thank you for being with us. The topic of this session will be on regional economic cooperation in the Western Balkans. The title is, Where Do We Stand? Our aim is to come together with ideas on, you know, where do you want to go? And uh, how do we get there? I think the how is also the most difficult part, but also the most important one. I'm Valbona Zanelli, the Chair of Strategic Initiatives at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies. And I'm really honored and pleased to be back here. Uh, it's great. Uh, it's been two wonderful days. And I thank very much the organizers, but also all of you for your great insights. In this panel, we have Mr. Alexander Valau. He is the head of Division 212 in the bilateral relations to the countries of uh, Central, Southeastern, and Eastern Europe, also Southern Caucasus and Central Asia at the German Federal Chancellor in Berlin. Thank you, Mr. Valau, for being with us. Uh, Ms. Ranvera Krastrati, she is the Common Regional Market Coordinator at the Regional Cooperation Council. Mr. Nenat Djurjevic, he is the advisor to the Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Belgrade, Serbia. Welcome. Uh, Ms. Jelica Minic, the President of the European Movement in Serbia, Belgrade and also Professor Silvana Moisovska. She is a professor at the Institute of Economics at the San Cyril and Methodius University in Skopje. So thank you all for, for being with us. As you see, there is, I did not go through the bios because I think all of you know them. Uh, they have been part of this network for a very long time. And so there's so much experience, uh, I think, in this panel. Uh, when the Berlin process started back in 2014, uh, actually, you know, two of the four uh, goals of the Berlin process relate to economic development, and that is enhancing regional economic cooperation and also laying the foundations for sustainable economic growth. As we all know, it's all about the economics. And so uh, also in the recommendations that we had, uh, we did not have recommendations on regional economic uh, integration, and I think we'll come up with some. Because everything that we have discussed, I think, leads to that. The last panel will be on EU integration, which is the final uh, uh, goal. Uh, when you ask people in the Western Balkans, and that was done from Regional Cooperation Council just a couple of months ago, uh, almost 50% of them, so 47% of them, mentioned as the main security challenge, economic situation. The second most important, by 40% almost, it's unemployment related. Um, corruption, we discussed about that in the previous panel for almost 30% of the citizens in the region. And also a new uh, concern that came up this year but has been in discussion for a long time, which is brain drain. Even more concerning, if you ask people in the region, young people, almost 70% of them want to emigrate. So uh, these are the main security challenges. Economic convergence with the West, with Western European countries, has stalled, unfortunately. There have been three dip, dip <coughs> recessions in the region since 2008, and that has made uh, the conversion really very difficult when the income per capita on average in the region is only 15% of the average of the European Union. And that explains many of the challenges that we have been discussing over the last um, two days. It will need 50 to 75 years for citizens in the region to catch up economically with the partners, uh, with the countries in the EU. So I'd like to start with you, Mr. Valau. Um, we know that the Berlin process from the very beginning, the goal was to close this economic and institutional gap that exists uh, with the Western European countries. So this has been crucial not only for the Berlin process, but also for the EU integration uh, more uh, in, in a bigger context. So what lies ahead uh, for the region in terms of economic integration? What will be new, if you can tell us something, in the Berlin process? And what will be the focus? But then I also have another point, and I hope you can make that in five minutes, uh, describe. Um, and that will be, what are the measures for transparency and accountability? How are leaders in Berlin, but also you know, the European leaders more in large, how are they going to keep the leaders of the Balkans, Western Balkans, accountable for the commitments that they make? Yeah. 
Yes. Well, thank you and good afternoon um, from, from me here, also in Berlin. And uh, my apologies for not being able to join you um, um, also in person and also uh, with an attempt to diversify the, the panel, at least the one that is, uh, that, uh, that is in presence um, there. But we are in the, um, me and my team are in the final stages of putting the finishing touches on tomorrow's summit. So, um, um, indeed, we are we are quite busy here still, and uh, nevertheless, I thought it would be a good opportunity to um, to uh, inform you on where we stand and what we have in store, and perhaps also look on on the questions you you raised. I mean, five minutes is not enough for that, but uh, and I, I have to also admit that I am a bit of a superstitious person, um, so I still will be a bit uh, cautious, but and I don't want to want to jump the gun, but I do want to underline that um, what is in store for um, regional economic cooperation, I'd say we are on the brink of some very good news. Um, you may have all followed the foreign minister's ministerial um, a few days ago, and we are um, looking forward to being able to open a new chapter tomorrow um, at the summit by the signing of three agreements under um, the um, for, for the common regional market, which uh, which were negotiated by by um, the um, the RCC, um, these three agreements will lead to um, the potential of untapping the full economic power that the regional common market um, has. Um, but I also want to look back on what we've already achieved in the Berlin process uh, regarding um, economic um, economic development and integration. I mean, um, we have seen rails and roadways uh, have been built. Um, 2020, we saw the introduction of green lanes and last year, um, the abolishment of roaming charges. You know, these, these things always sound very technical, but in the end, they are they are big economic leaps because they make day-to-day -day life easier and they make interconnection easier. And in the end, this is what, what economic and regional cooperation is all about. So if all goes well, tomorrow we will, we will see the signing of, um, of three agreements on um, ID card free travel, um, as well as the um, um, recognition of professional qualifications and um, diplomas. So three key agreements in the mobility sector, which will en enable um, uh, citizens of the Western Balkan Six to, to freely travel, but also to take up work uh, qualifications in, um, in the region. And in the end, these are elements that also make up the EU internal market. And the more um, the, more the regional common market um, moves closer to the EU um, common market, the, the more not only economic potential is there, but the more benefit is there can be untapped for all. So these are indeed, um, I have to say, major breakthroughs when this is tomorrow signed. The um, proof of the matter will then lie in implementation, as is always the case. But I'd say that there, um, under the auspices of, of RCC and also in the end, the eyes of the region, Europe and of the world are looking on, on, on this summit and on the implementation of these agreements. Uh, this in turn should already be, uh, be accountability, be, 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 be an element of accountability. Um, there's another aspect that we are looking at, which also, which also uh, sort of builds on, on security issues, which is energy, um, which um, also feeds into the whole broader economic picture on the one hand, but also the geopolitical one as well. Um, we see also in the energy field, in particular electricity, huge potential for cooperation among the Western Balkan Six um, to use uh, electricity grids, to, uh, but also to make sure that the um, interconnectors between the Western Balkan Six, but also to the European Union are enhanced. And this in the end will make it easier um, for energy to flow freely, but also to decrease dependencies um, on some energy providers, um, something that we in Germany have, have uh, experienced in the last few uh, few months since the uh, against the backdrop of the Russian aggression in in Ukraine, um, and simply the the, op, the 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 get the goal of being able to diversify energy sources. Um, is a huge step in order to um, foster resilience and to, to again, um, enhance regional cooperation. 
I think I'll stop there um, regarding regarding your last question on um, uh, you know what 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 can be done to to ensure accountability and and that uh, that the the leaders of the Western Balkans um, commit to to the engagements that they have done. I'd have to say at least what the Chancellor has done, the Chancellor Scholz, since taking up office, is to underline that the EU also has to deliver on um, the accession processes. Um, we have there reason to believe that a new chapter has been opened. In the end, it's all about accountability. It's about reforms. It's about um, following through on reforms. And at least I, for one, am very confident that um, with the new dynamics that, that are already palpable in the region and which we also hope to inject in tomorrow's uh, summit, things are uh, looking very good. So I'll stop there um, and looking forward to, to further discussions and questions. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the good news. So uh, I hope you'll get some insights from our panel in terms of recommendations that you could uh, bring up also uh, tomorrow. Uh, I have another question, but we'll come in the second round uh, for you later on. Uh, Pramvera, I would um, you know, like to ask you from the Regional Cooperation Council perspective, what are some of the successes that have been achieved? Mr. Vallo all mentioned some of them. What are the challenges, but also what are your main priorities? If we say like the three main priorities for the next year to come uh, in terms of uh, fostering more regional economic cooperation. And please try also to quantify because, you know, we talk a lot about these issues, but uh, we need also in terms of communication with the public, we need to bring up numbers out there. We need to show them what has been done. Thank you. Um, indeed. Communicating the results is where you start to build confidence that you are delivering. And uh, I believe that uh, Berlin process and common regional market uh, is delivering, of course, with all, uh, let's say, all the hurdles in the process and in some, in some moments uh, with delays, in some others much more faster. Uh, but of course, it's delivering. And I think that uh, for us in the RCC, but not just in the RCC, but in the region, the accountability of what our citizens uh, believe and think is what makes us uh, uh, driving uh, the agenda. So just to quantify a bit, the Balkan Barometer 2022 says that 76% uh, of our citizens and 69% of our businesses believe that the regional cooperation is the response for a better political, economic, and security uh, in the Western Balkans. And while having that in mind, uh, we have pushed the implementation of many agendas uh, within the common regional market. Uh, green lanes were mentioned. Indeed, this came as a response to COVID and uh, from uh, a response to an unpredicted situation. Now it has become a reality and it has become a, a daily uh, practice, but it, did, it didn't stop there. Uh, we had initially the green lanes uh, within uh, the Western Balkans. Now we are going a step further and we are extending this to the EU, which will make the life for businesses easier and uh, faster uh, movement of goods throughout the region and beyond. Uh, roaming was also mentioned, and I think that uh, with the introduction of Rome like at home from 1st July last year, I think that we brought connectivity uh, of people, so people-to-people -people connectivity in the region uh, closer and more visible. Just to uh, give some figures, after the entry into force of the Rome, like at home regime, the number of roaming users in the Western Balkans doubled. And the use of data while roaming in some of the economies uh, was up to 500% increase, which means that it is producing results and it is producing very good ones. And this is not something that again will stop. It will be again part of the regional, regional um, uh, cooperation and, and efforts to reduce the roaming charges with EU. This is our next objective and our next goal. And uh, I hope that uh, soon we'll have uh, another good news uh, for the citizens of the Western Balkans, but not only, also for the EU citizens, whenever they come in the region, they don't need to turn off their mobile data because the bill is very high. Uh, in addition to that, the three agreements have been, uh, let's say, announced as a breakthrough, and we are really uh, all looking forward to tomorrow's uh, signing. But we believe that uh, with the problems of and, and the concerns of the brain drain, as we said, the figure is very worrisome, but uh, we in RCC, we do not shy away of the problems because for us, knowing the problem 
uh, means we know how to address it and how to work uh, all together about it. And uh, with these three uh, mobility agreements, uh, we are confident that it will also improve the mobility of professionals and also uh, it, it will facilitate uh, different works and educational, uh, let's say, uh, impetus to less costly for the region. So academic qualification, uh, for instance, or higher education uh, recognition, uh, currently takes months for a recognition. According to the agreement, it will take not more than 14 days. Currently, we pay uh, 40 to 400 to 500 euros for a recognition process. With the agreement, it will cost zero. So these are results that, in a way, build confidence to uh, build confidence to the region that this uh, this process delivers. But it is important to highlight that it delivers when political will is there and where citizens are at the. Uh, main line uh, of speaking of the politicians and whenever this brings results for them. Uh, there are many other uh, agendas that are flourishing uh, as part of the common regional market uh, um, in general, but I would uh, just try to say three challenges So, for me to, to conclude that. I think that the twin transition, uh, digital and green transition, is uh, uh, one of the challenges that we have in the region, and uh, uh, we uh, already uh, see this as a policy that should be mainstreamed uh, throughout all policy agendas. The second one is how to make our region uh, a boat where it's lovely to stay and not a boat from where you want to live. And in other words, this means to have uh, a better uh, environment for our citizens, quality of life, uh, less barriers in communicating among us, and of course, uh, let's say, a an increase and strengthened uh, connectivity uh, between uh, all between, uh, people. And third, reconciliation, which for us uh, uh, in, in the regional cooperation um, means a lot in achieving and in, in getting the results, because uh, many of the hurdles of the past are time after time, time after time coming from political to technical, and they are switching one uh, to the other and, and creating delays. So these would be for me a concluding part for the first uh, round of questions. Well, thank you very much. And actually, you know, for the, uh, as the, in the EU integration process, the economic integration has been always the main pillar or one of the main pillars that will bring also reconciliation uh, in the region. Um, Nenat, I will ask you uh, a question uh, from the business perspective. So we're talking about the region. At the end of the day, the total market of the Western Balkans is about $130 billion, which is only 1% of the European Union market. Um, it attracts less than 0.2% of the foreign direct investment. When we are in a strategic you know, position, geographical position, uh, next to the European Union, and the European Union countries are not only, you know, one of the biggest investors in the global economy, but also they attract most of the investments uh, from uh, the global uh, investors. So we know, Neda, that um, things have changed since the times of SEFTA. Uh, there has been a reduction of uh, the tariffs among, you know, for the intra-regional trade. However, we know that the burden now is a lot in the non-tariff barriers. So from the business perspective, uh, what should the governments do to create a friendly business environment where companies will trade more uh, you know, inside the region, but also invest more? So it's not only about trade, because we focus on trade. The most important element, I think, is investment, because that is the most sustainable one. So from the business community, what are your perspectives? Well, thanks for the question. Hello to the audience. Good afternoon to everyone from Belgrade. I'm happy to be at this panel. Uh, and on your concrete question, I'll try to give you a concrete answer. And what the government should do, I think the government should completely change the current paradigm of cooperation. Uh, also among themselves and also the paradigm of cooperation between the Western Balkans and the EU. Uh, all the figures that you added, that you mentioned, I will add one more, that actually the, uh, 
we can see that a continuous decrease of intra-regional cooperation or uh, economic exchange. So there is a less exchange between the, government, the countries of the Western Balkans uh, in the past uh, years than it used to be before. So uh, governments, or, or how to say, one can say that these economies are more linked to the, to the production uh, chains of uh, value chains that are linked to the uh, developing, uh, developing country, developed countries of the European Union. Nevertheless, the sustainable economic model need to look for a bigger intra-regional economic cooperation, exchange, inv investment, and so on and so forth. So how to achieve this? Uh, it's a big question. I think, as I said, first thing is that uh, the current uh, system or current uh, reality of uh, cooperation or communication in the Western Balkans didn't show or didn't give sufficient results. Uh, if we also see the Berlin process that was uh, initiated to foster and to give an impetus to this regional cooperation, I think that it gave also uh, pretty modest results. I really support and cherish all the achievements in the area of, uh, of the free roaming, and I really uh, am thankful to the German government and the partners for, I'll say, um, helping for the three agreements to be uh, accepted and adopted and be tomorrow formally signed. However, uh, bearing in mind the, the realities of Europe, the turn of the era, which I think is uh, one uh, word that in very much after the February 24th, I think we should also look for the turn of the era in the Western Balkans in respect to, 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 to regional cooperation. Uh, all the agreements that are currently in place, all the initiatives that have been started from the Common Regional Market Protection Plan, uh, okay, CEFTA, which is a, a kind of a umbrella agreement for trade, Open Balkan initiatives, we, that is all initiatives that we as a chamber, as a chambers, as a business community do support. We support everything that really the government showed any commitment for uh, better cooperation, for removing the barriers, for deepening the, 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 the cooperation, for uh, creating a common regional market, but fully common regional market, not a facilitation of common regional market. So uh, we believe that now, fortunately and unfortunately for this, uh, because there is a, this really disastrous war in Ukraine that is uh, going on because of the, uh, of the, of the invasion of Russia, uh, all of us need to look and to work within the new paradigm and to see how to uh, create institutions within the region that can give an answer to the, all these needs from energy uh, cooperation to food security cooperation and all the rest, which is also part of the common regional market. And for this, uh, we believe that uh, we have to talk about uh, different or new initiatives that can come after the tomorrow summit. Namely, we think that more uh, responsibility need to be given to the local governments, regional governments uh, in adopting and uh, uh, implementing the regional economic cooperation agenda uh, that uh, they should be the responsible key players and to implementing this agenda, that all other institutions that are created within the Berlin process can and should provide expert support, technical support, uh, know how, from instance, how the European Union has been created from European Economic Association to, to, to single market and all other uh, known recipes, but their main responsibility should be on the local, on the local uh, uh, government that should take reason serious part in this and show that are they willing to take responsibility or not this is the first thing and the second thing we definitely believe and we are sharing this uh, i believe also with our colleagues from ukraine that uh, 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 turn of the era also in this respect would be or should be uh, ability for the western balkans to have an access to the EU single market and to have a new 
agreement with the EU in this respect, of course, based on the merit uh, and the results that each country in the Western Balkans show. I think that this kind of uh, change would actually distribute uh, responsibility much more on the local stakeholders, at the same time having a very credible uh, end result uh, of this process. And this, we should state, should be just one step towards full-fledged uh, EU integration. But we are aware that because of the current situation in the European Union, uh, in the uh, process of enlargement, the full-fledged EU integration for the Western Balkans and also for Ukraine and Moldova is not uh, something which we can speak about in a foreseeable future. But membership in a single market will show really concrete benefits for the citizens, for the companies, for the EU companies, and can really uh, help transforming the region uh, for good. And if you see what are the clusters that will enable uh, or the govern single market access to the EU, those clusters also uh, are uh, taking into consideration the rule of law as well. So uh, this is something which I think uh, the day after tomorrow, all of us, uh, including Germany, who is who was an initiator of the of the Berlin process, should, should think about. And I believe that also uh, disputes or um, use this word moderate word between uh, Serbia and Kosovo uh, maybe could be better looked upon if there is a regional perspective of it and if there is a perspective of the. Uh, membership of the single market of the, of the, uh, for, for the older, older region. Uh, this is something which uh, we as a chamber and few chambers of the, of the region are strongly advocating. We are continuing to do that. So I think this is some of the thoughts that maybe will give uh, some positive um, or the new change uh, in respect to the uh, regional economic operation with the, with, within the Western Balkans and then the the, the, the communication with the, between the EU and the Western Blocks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nina. Thank you for your insights and suggestions. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really very important that uh, once the countries have achieved the standards as part of the fundamentals cluster and the economic cluster, it's important that they become part of the single market, uh, but also have more access to EU budgets because that will speed up, you know, the, 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 the convergence process with, uh, with the other EU countries. Um, Yelitsa, so what should we do or how should we put the regional economic integration in a much broader context? And uh, you have been writing and working a lot on, on, this, on this topic. So um, let me ask you this. Is there a vision of common economic market in, in the Western Balkans? Uh, what do we need to do to foster that? And when I, when I mention that, how can we put that in a much broader context is that, you know, how do we aim to advancing human capital? How do we aim at bringing, you know, advancing circular migration, so bringing people back in the region? So what are your thoughts? Well, um, I would say that uh, at the beginning, when um, the regional economic area was launched in Trieste, everybody was against that, um, commenting that this is a substitute for European integration, that we want to join European Union, not to develop a regional market. Then the dynamics, um, of course, we know how it happened. Uh, the Open Balkans appeared, uh, joining like-minded countries. We are now Open Balkans. Albania, Macedonia, Serbia, Albania, uh, Serbia. Um, it, it happened like that. <laughs> so, uh, at the end, uh, thanks to Open Balkans, now everybody accepted common regional market. Now, common regional market is fully accepted because it's a better variant. It's inclusive. It, is, uh, it has a more complex agenda, what is very important. Uh, 
Common Regional Market also launched recently this research and, and innovation roadmap. Yes. This is a very important direction. It's going above uh, for freedoms. Uh, but everybody was taking what, uh, even uh, Open Balkans, was taking everything that was prepared in different regional initiatives, first of all uh, in uh, the regional cooperation councils, or ideas, or uh, documents, uh, even the three documents that are going to be adopted uh, tomorrow. In fact, they were prepared uh, in the uh, Regional Cooperation Council, but also adopted uh, through the Open Balkans. So we have parallel tracks. It is not easy to handle uh, this situation, but on the other side, it works. What is the future? I personally believe uh, uh, there will be uh, 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 this um, uh, match um, uh, in this match, the winner will be common regional market. But on the other side, Open Balkans uh, both the time. Uh, regional Cooperation Council and other regional initiatives had a lot of problems because of uh, uh, relations between uh, Serbia and Kosovo. And many good initiatives were blocked, in fact. It was not possible to sign any agreement of this uh, size, all six uh, stakeholders. So it happened now, and I think this is the pressure of the situation, the war in Ukraine. We have a different context now of regional cooperation. Not only the war in Ukraine, uh, we had COVID that changed a lot. We had green lanes thanks to uh, COVID. Then we had, um, uh, this year, we had also the uh, idea of European political community launched, uh, which has some common elements uh, like uh, new methodology for Western Balkan countries. And this is not only, uh, uh, well, this is the single market, but also the idea of sectoral integration, merit-based sectoral integration offer for the Western Balkan countries that those who uh, made appropriate advance in uh, specific sectors would have access to even uh, EU institutions as observers uh, to follow the process. And I think it's very important to involve uh, Western Balkan countries in as many as possible EU institutions to be there, to follow the processes and to learn. Be observers, but have a chance to learn how to operate, how, to, how the decision-making is done, uh, how the, the concepts have been developed. This is a very important uh, learning process. Uh, we also have an economic and investment plan. There are so many elements on the table, and we have to somehow to... to uh, take whatever we can from that offer. It's a serious offer. We always complain, but on the other side, we have to focus ourselves to use the opportunities in the best possible way. And in the recommendations given in um, uh, this booklet, we can find the uh, recommendations for civil society in the region, that civil society should make this social pressure to uh, get our countries together, to approach our governments to work more closely, to develop networks of the civil society, to make a joint advocacy, because when we speak with one voice, it is much better assessed. Then it seems that we really have a vision. And finally, I was very glad reading that uh, Mrs. Baerbock uh, said to Mrs. Malinda Bregu that uh, the Regional Cooperation Council is the major force of the Berlin process. 
it is so rarely that um, in, uh, uh, since the Berlin process was established that the work of regional initiatives was praised in such a way. It's not only Regional Cooperation Council, we have CEFTA, Transport Community, many other initiatives that uh, were involved. All of them uh, did uh, really a great work and they were always uh, um, stopped and blocked by political processes. So the main problem is in political processes. If we expect uh, the, the, this uh, project of regional cooperation to be successful, it uh, uh, has to gather those who have the same interest, those uh, who develop certain level of trust, mutual trust, this is a big problem, those who are really committed and those who are able to provide external support. If these four conditions are fulfilled, then we are on the safe road. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you Yelitsa. I think there's been no shortage of signing initiatives in, in the Western Balkans in the last 30 years. So the main question that we have been discussing over and over again is implementation yes. and how uh, we keep governments accountable uh, for uh, implementation. That's the role of civil societies. So that's why we are here together. Um, I'll go to you, Silvana. Um, you are a scholar that have been working for a very long time in studying you know, the different uh, initiatives. So um, could you give us a picture of the regional initiatives and their impact uh, uh, in the region, in the Western Balkans? And what are your recommendations as a scholar? And um, being a professor, maybe if you can mention something about uh, the importance of promoting linkages between academia, uh, industry, and, uh, and governments in the Western Balkans. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Greetings to all. And uh, we've heard uh, many notions about the recent developments in the regional uh, cooperation of the Balkans, but it's an old topic. In 2001, uh, the ministries of uh, our Western Balkan countries dealing with foreign affairs and trade decided to sign uh, the bilateral trade agreements. And that's how CEFTA, the, the uh, initiation of SEFTA started. The SEFTA was then signed in 2006. Uh, the SEFTA, there is a, a habit to have a SEFTA week uh, that is held every year in the country that is holding the presidency. In 2016, uh, it was in Belgrade, I remember, and for the first time, um, it was uh, a Serbian minister uh, saying that SEFTA is disappointing. It did not deliver the results. I will now tell you the data, why it was said like that, and why it is actually sometimes uh, important to uh, talk very openly about that. In 2010, uh, SEFTA was, uh, intra-SEFTA export in the region was around 4.8 billion euros and uh, SEFTA import was a bit less. But it's more important to say how uh, was that in a relative terms. At that time, in 2010, around 90% of the export was done in the region and 9% of the import was done within the region as well. In 2017, we had a situation that only 16% of the export was done in the region. And now, in 2021, we had only 13.8% uh, of the export of the region done in the SEFTA. In absolute terms, the export and import increased. So if we compare 2010, uh, when it was like uh, 4.8 uh, billion euros, the export. In 2021, it was around uh, 6 billion euros. But uh, if we compare the increase of the trade in the region, then we have another picture. In 2010, in 2017, uh, it was like 30 billion, all export from the region. And uh, five years later, it was 43. So we can see an extreme 
uh, growth of the trade uh, of the region, but that was not SEFTA related. However, after this famous SEFTA week, I would say in 2016, uh, some things have started to move. And the initiatives that we are talking now uh, that uh, have provided some success were actually initiated then. Uh, and uh, SEFTA was dealing more uh, to finding, to, to signing protocols related to trade in services, uh, uh, protocol on trade facilitation or removal of uh, the non-tariff uh, barriers. And then uh, there was also a discussion about this mutual recognition of uh, uh, some of the professional uh, diplomas in certain areas and so and so and so. In the meantime, uh, in 2017, there was the initiatives for regional economic area. And that initiative, as uh, Yelitsa mentioned very well, it lived in terms of politics, but it didn't live operationally until the Open uh, Balkan Initiative was launched as an internal initiative of the countries. So, uh, what was done now, it's actually, I can see there is a lot of progress, uh, especially in the area of uh, digital connection of the countries, the fourth pillar of this regional economic area, or now uh, the uh, common market. And I'm not going to go into a professor explanation about area and market and so on, but I must say that now the ambition of the market is actually much deeper integration than it was envisaged at first. That is probably uh, a response to the Open uh, Balkan Initiative, which is good, uh, but we could not do that without support. When I say support, uh, we have to have uh, in mind that all these regional initiatives absorb a lot of resources of the countries, and not always that we have resources. When it comes now to the first pillar of the common market, which is related to the trade, and it's most developed, I've already uh, said the data about the export and import. But uh, the companies are really struggled, uh, struggling with non-tariff measures and trade facilitation <laughs> barriers. Um, almost every year or every two years, there is an empirical research done uh, and funded by the European Union of the companies and they express what are the barriers they face. Uh, the barriers uh, they reported last year were more or less the same in all the Western Balkan countries. And uh, the main one is uh, that the countries mutually do not recognize the certificates that are needed on the process of export or import of uh, certain goods. And here we have as a major uh, obstacle the sanitary and phytosanitary agreement. Serbia has been the main exporter in the region and also an importer as it's uh, a large economy. And uh, for example, North Macedonia and Bosnia are uh, second and third. Uh, these two countries, North Macedonia and Serbia, uh, have an agreement for mutual recognition of uh, uh, these uh, certificates since uh, 2016. So if you ask the business people, they would say, why are you asking us all the time these questions? We are doing these empirical reports and we are sending that to the government, but we don't see any improvement. So the first recommendation, all these studies and a really empirical based uh, analysis uh, should somehow reach the government and be implemented into practice because business is choosing either is going to work with some other uh, partner from some other country if it's less uh, costly and it's more uh, time effective. In this case, it's the European Union. Then when we uh, talk about the investment, uh, the investment in general is not big, but it's important in terms of this uh, cooperation and actually showing that this regional cooperation is not so huge because these companies, foreign direct investors, they actually export to the European Union. So we have a situation uh, when uh, the trade in the region as the first pillar is actually there is a lot of trade potential. 
but it takes uh, for the policies to be aligned and for more uh, actions on the spot to ease the life of the business in order to see uh, proper benefits. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Silvana. Uh, there is so much, you know, here also to digest in terms of recommendations and I already see the sign that we only have 15 minutes left and I have so many questions. But uh, I'd like to go to uh, Alexander for a quick question. Uh, we're in Berlin, Alexander, so my question is very simple. Are we going to see a Zeitenwende in the Western Balkans? How can we foster economic development there, not just for regional economic integration, but to bring it closer to the EU in an area of strategic competition, but also considering uh, the rise of well, Chinese interests in the region for you know, strategic, strategic competition? Well, I, I mean, a Zeitenwende um, is, is probably what is needed in so many sectors. And um, I mean, if we look at what Zeitenwende means, that, that events after, or yeah, that everything after a certain event is, is completely different to what we have known and, and seen before, I would agree that, uh, that a Zeitenwende is necessary. And um, at least as being someone who has been following um, the Berlin process now over this and last summit, um, I have to say that we have already made a lot of progress. Um, and uh, I mean, a Zeitenwende also requires that the foundations are there. And at least this is something we are working on. I would agree that further impulses are necessary for the process um, to, to, fill it mit, to fill it fill it with life and with, with dynamics. And that's something which I hope we will be able to achieve tomorrow. Because if I look back at the last year, um, the Zeitenwende and the backdrop to which we are doing all this um, has changed dramatically, and uh, one of the elements um, which which some some put very carefully about discussions disputes between Kosovo and Serbia, we find that this is something that that is harmful for the region and it should be um, should be uh, should be covered as quickly as possible to make progress there huh? against the backdrop of, uh, of the geopolitical situation that we have. The region and Europe have to move closer together and the region as a whole has to move closer together. So, and there we are working on that as well. Huh? Um, I think uh, also filling the Kosovo, uh, the, the Pristina Belgrade dialogue with new life is something that that is beneficial, not only for um, for Serbia and Kosovo, but also for the region as such. Mm -hmm. um, this is in the end what will what has blocked the um, the three agreements um, over the last 12 months. Uh, we, we were met, we, we are indeed uh, can be proud that we have somehow managed to contain the problem um, in a way that we can that we, we can move forward on the agreements these are little steps these are not uh, it's it's not the big uh, the big uh, site and vendor but um, it is something that should not be belittled as uh, either i think these are the, these are the elements that we have to build on well, Thanks. thank you. I think it's very important that after 30 years, we move from seeing the region for its problems and making the region part of the transatlantic solutions, part of European and transatlantic solutions. So from this perspective, when I mentioned Site and Vende, it's like, how can we look that the regional market contributes to European strategic autonomy too, when it comes to energy, when it comes to nearshoring or ally shoring, how we want to call it. So I think that is important that we are part of of solutions. Um, I have two quick questions and I'll throw those uh, in the panel. Um, do we, I think, you know, we should we also take uh, questions from uh, from the audience? Okay, so uh, I would like to go back to Pranvera regarding the issue of uh, migration and brain drain, but also human capital. So we're seeing that in terms of percentage, there are many, a large number of population is leaving uh, the region and because of institutional and income gaps that exist. Uh, but in the long term, this is creating uh, mismatches between, um, between what are the available skills and what will be needed for uh, new industries there. So uh, what can we do also in the framework of the Berlin process and other regional initiatives to uh, uh, foster circular migration? Well, um, there might be different ways of, of addressing it. But I think that uh, we should start from uh, a better cooperation between academia and private sector to, uh, to do upskilling uh, within the region 
in particular on those sectors that are needed, uh, where, where skills are still lacking in the market. In addition to this, uh, I guess that uh, uh, dedicated uh, uh, traineeship and mentorship to the youngsters to bring them closer to the market needs and, and labor market uh, demand uh, would also help to bring hope that in the region they might fight, uh, they might find, uh, um, let's say, different option uh, employment opportunities. And while combining this with also um, the, the, let's say, adequate implementation of the agreements that we are now uh, hoping tomorrow to, to see the signing and make the implementation uh, a reality where the mobility of skills in the region uh, is strengthened. I guess that uh, through this, we are bringing more benefits to what the market needs are and what the business needs uh, are in this regard. Combining uh, the policies in particular to research and innovation and through the uh, dedicated policy reforms in the education system, um, I think that uh, uh, brain drain and migration is also uh, to be seen in the perspective of economic cost that this uh, has for, uh, for, the, for the economies. And uh, uh, just to say one uh, very recent uh, figure from the um, uh, German Marshall uh, Fund, that high tendency of the brain drain in the region would cost the region's economy around 3 billion of uh, yearly GDP growth. And also the cost that uh, this movement of the youngsters uh, abroad, not in the region, is also bringing a lot of economic losses to the education system. So I guess uh, more investment in the education, but with an approach that the education is not seen only as one step for you to complete your professional career, but as a starting point for you to start uh, looking uh, for a job and be placed in the market where your skills are, uh, let's say, uh, necessary, I think this should be the way out of uh, trying to close the gap and the mismatch between the demand and the offer for skills in the region. Absolutely, and that will increase the competitiveness of the region. Silvana, Yelisa, do you have any comments on this specific issue? Quick, quick points, or we can move to the other? On human capital. On human capital. Well, I think uh, this dimension of uh, innovation, Yeah which is also uh, uh, stressed by the Regional Cooperation Council and the, the competition uh, that is organized among young entrepreneurs. And yeah. uh, I think uh, uh, a lot uh, should be done there because there is a capacity in the region still, although there is a huge brain drain. And there is uh, an interest for smart specialization in the region, but it means decentralization, much greater role of local communities in Serbia of regions. There are huge regional differences. We have to mobilize different uh, uh, energies that do exist in our societies uh, through decentralization process because um, there are a uh, lot of ideas of what should be done, but it's not possible with uh, systems that are highly, highly centralized. Mm -hmm. And so maybe also more funds from the European Union or also in the framework of the Berlin process to increase those absorptive capacities, both for young people, but also for, you know, for businesses in that perspective. And I'd like to ask Nenad, uh, maybe if you can explain in one minute what do you see as challenges also when it comes to human capital and skills that are needed for the industries of the future and the present? Oh, well, political stability and predictability is the same as for the investments. You need to have the long-term political predictability and the stability to know how to, how to say, plan your economic, social, and other development. Uh, you need to, how to say, uh, create auspices that uh, uh, not only geographically to be part of the, e of the Europe, but also to be uh, in a foreseeable future part of the European Union. And also at the same time to create possibilities and jobs and uh, educational capacities in the region. So to avoid or as much as possible to, to hamper brain drain to, to the European Union. So it's a very complex thing. Now we, you know, we have just a brain drain without any control. Uh, we also have some, you know, brain drain from Russia coming to the region and to Serbia due to the, to the war in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, but what we can do is really to have, have this kind of uh, basic uh, uh, pillars 
of our development. And uh, I would just refer to one of the panelists who said, uh, uh, you know, everything was okay with the Berlin process and all the regional cooperation, but was stopped by the political processes. So nothing is okay then. If the political process can stop it, then nothing is okay because, you know, we have to see how these political processes be part of a unified system of the development towards the EU. So if the political process is a problem, which means that methodologically speaking, something is wrong. In the process, something is wrong. Well, and I think we should address that. And one more thing I would just like to add. Uh, I really, uh, how I say, was very, how to say, somehow uh, emotional when I heard um, Chancellor Scholz and he said, uh, Zeitenwende and this turn of the era in respect to the huge change in Europe that happened after uh, February 24th. So I would really like to say that we shouldn't uh, use this word just for everything. It shouldn't be an in, in inflation of Zeitenwende also for the Western Balkans. If there is a really uh, turn of the era for the Western Balkans, then it's not three agreements that we're going to sign tomorrow. This is something which was long overdue two years ago. And it's because of the political developments mm -hmm. and political whatever didn't happen. This is good for the region, it's positive, but it's not set and end. So I don't really realize that there is something, how to say, that needs to be done deeply into the process, into the methodology, how the process has, uh, has been run so far, or just not to pretend it's a set and end for the region, it's not. Mm -hmm. And well, Serbia, Kosovo, I read some papers, it's positive, but don't uh, forget, it also can be positive for the region and negative for the region. The economic pa uh, package that can support the uh, agreement on normalization between Serbia and Kosovo should be also a regional package, because we are all interdependent, just don't forget that. Well, well, thank you, Nenad. We had a panel here uh, today talking about corruption and good governance. And I think, you know, as you were pointing out, together with the political will, we need to talk about an economic rule of law or economic good governance. So really? fighting corruption, not just for the sake of fighting corruption, but how to foster economic development. So maybe that's a linkage that we need to look. When I mentioned the Zeit and Wende, is that I think it's time that the Western Balkans is not seen anymore as the backyard of the European Union in, in the framework of what's happening all around Europe, but it's the front yard when it comes to strategic competition too. So I think that's important. But I'll give the final floor um, to Silvana. Uh, I think we have about one minute <laughs> to go. Oh, two minutes. Uh, minute. <laughs> uh, I would just point out that with regards to the human capital, we need more regional initiatives when it comes uh, to the education joint programs, uh, research programs, or something. We need to bring the region uh, closer to the young people. Uh, they are, they, they uh, somehow uh, more relate themselves to the European Union, to the developed countries, than to the region. Uh, making such initiatives would uh, give new impetus to the region and uh, would actually see the countries in a wider context because we are small countries with so many problems all over the years. We do need to see each other, uh, how, we, uh, how we could function as a region and also uh, the possibilities that uh, the region uh, brings itself. And in that perspective, the region could actually be uh, a, a place where the ideas for regional cooperation could come, but the European Union must be responsive and uh, we need to look for the initiatives that deliver results, not for the initiatives that last for 20, 30 years without any specific results, because the region is getting tired. People are getting tired and they're going out of the countries. And without human capital, we could not count off on the region uh, that would join Europe, no European Union, no matter when that would happen. Thank well, well, thank you very much. I think it's all about the recognition that the countries are too small if they are fragmented. Uh, they're don't, do not, they lack capacities, both financial or human capital. So 
if countries will not get together, uh, they will not be competitive, not just in the European market, but also bigger in the global market. So uh, we had planned at the very beginning that we'll have a lot of time because we said that we're women, so we'll be short and we'll uh, go to the, uh, to the points. But uh, this has been a fascinating uh, panel, a lot of good insights that hopefully, Alexander, you took some good notes and things that you know, will be useful for your work. Thank you for, for supporting the region. Thank you, Nenad. Uh, thank you, Pramvera, Yelitsa, Silvana, thank you to all of you. And I apologize, I did a bad job as a moderator. They did not allow time for uh, questions and answers. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. I, I like this, what an element.